Welcome back. In this lecture, I'm going to explain the PRISM program under Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. As I hope you recall from the last part of the course, Section 702 has a very unusual structure. Each year, the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence have a set of certifications and procedures authorized by the FISA court. Then, the intelligence community can unilaterally issue directives in accordance with those procedures. The directives function like a combination of a provider warrant and a wiretap order. At base, the PRISM program is, simply, issuance of targeted Section 702 directives to technology services. I want to emphasize that these are targeted directives. The NSA only receives information about specific sets of individuals. PRISM is not a bulk surveillance program. It's a big surveillance program, but it is targeted. In 2008, the Fisker sustained these targeted directives under the Protect America Act, the predecessor to the FISA Amendments Act. To be precise, Yahoo's challenge actually involved Americans who were targeted. As I hope you recall, that part of the Protect America Act was not renewed. So, while the opinion doesn't squarely address surveillance targeting foreigners, it's generally been read to sustain the entire PRISM program. In the balance of this lecture, I'd like to step through the mechanics of PRISM surveillance. And I'm going to make fairly extensive use of the NSA's own slides. This slide diagrams the workflow for PRISM surveillance. I'd like to call your attention to four key steps. PRISM surveillance begins with an NSA analyst nominating a target for surveillance. I'll come back to that shortly. Next, the FBI issues a Section 702 directive to a technology service. Until the Snowden leaks, these services appear to have been unaware of the NSA's role. They believed they were cooperating with the FBI, much like if they had received a warrant or a wiretap order. The directive includes a list of technical targeting criteria chosen by the analyst. In NSA lingo, those are called selectors. And for PRISM surveillance, selectors are most commonly something like a username or email address. Third, the technology service provides content to the FBI. The content could be stored communications, like saved email, or it could be prospective communications, like future voice over IP calls. In the final step, the FBI returns the content it has received to the NSA. It also sometimes provides the content to its own investigators, as well as to CIA analysts. That was a lot of condensed material, so let me try rephrasing with another of the NSA slides. The process begins with an NSA analyst suggesting a surveillance target, including some technical criteria for picking out that target's communications. Then, the FBI serves a Section 702 directive on the technology service that the target is using. The service provides communications content back to the FBI in response. And finally, the FBI distributes the content it has received. That content always goes to the NSA, where it's internally analyzed in a number of ways. Sometimes copies are also provided to the FBI or to the CIA. All right, so that's the basic process for PRISM. Now let me circle back to how an analyst nominates a target. And there's an app for that, or, well, a website. It's called the Unified Targeting Tool, and this is a screenshot, with apologies for the low-resolution image. I'd like to highlight a few important steps within the targeting process. First an analyst provides some selectors. Again, those are technical criteria for targeting surveillance, like usernames or email addresses. This image, unfortunately, does not show the field for inputting selectors. An analyst also chooses the Section 702 certification that covers the target. 
Here, an analyst has selected the certification related to foreign governments, factions, entities, or political organizations. That's a pretty broad certification. I should note that two other certifications have been leaked, and they cover terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Recall that Section 702 requires a foreign intelligence purpose for surveillance. So the analyst selects the purpose from a drop-down menu. Also, recall that Section 702 only covers individuals outside the United States. And the statute requires some procedure for making sure individuals are outside the United States. Well, there are drop-downs for that too, and one of them is open in this image. Some rationales relate to technical evidence, like where a phone number is registered or where an internet protocol address appears to originate. Other rationales relate to public information or human intelligence operations or ongoing surveillance. In this image, the analyst's rationale is that the proposed target is communicating with an existing foreign target and no information indicates the proposed target is inside the United States. Let me put that differently. An analyst is entitled to assume that someone communicating with a previously approved target is also outside the United States. That's a pretty strong assumption. Okay, so that's how an analyst targets a person for PRISM surveillance. I should note that targeting does get reviewed before it goes into effect. And I should also note that once targeting is in place, other analysts can certainly take advantage of it. This slide depicts the RePRISM FISA tool, which appears to allow analysts to search through information that's already been collected under PRISM. You might be wondering which technology services are covered by PRISM. Well, there's a leaked slide on that, too. As of spring 2013, there were nine services, and they're ones you'd recognize, Google, Apple, Facebook, Skype, and so on. As for what information these businesses can provide in response to a Section 702 directive, well, the NSA also spells that out. It's exactly what you should expect, the full range of stored and prospective communications. It's very similar to what law enforcement could obtain with a provider warrant or a wiretap order. There's some lingering ambiguity in the technical details of how information flows from a technology service to the FBI. Some computer scientists have speculated that there's a common PRISM file format or protocol, or maybe software interface. This slide sometimes gets referenced in support of that view. Other technical experts think there are fairly ad hoc systems for moving information from technology services to the FBI, much like when a service responds to a warrant or wiretap order. If that's right, then this slide may just be about internal naming conventions. There is, regrettably, not much transparency in how often PRISM is used. This slide suggests that in 2012, there were roughly 3,000 new technical targeting criteria every month. By way of comparison, there are roughly as many new PRISM targets each month as there are ECPA wiretap targets in an entire year. PRISM is a pretty big program. As for how PRISM has been used, unfortunately, there isn't much transparency about that either. Leaked slides suggest a very broad range of foreign intelligence topics, ranging from traditional military and foreign affairs matters, to economic intelligence, to transnational criminal activities. During the Olympics, for instance, the NSA increased British intelligence access to PRISM for purposes of protecting the games. And on at least one occasion, PRISM mitigated a data breach at a defense contractor. So, there's no doubt that PRISM has been an incredibly successful intelligence program. It's the NSA's most used source for its intelligence reports, including the president's daily briefing. 
both the President's Intelligence Review Group and the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board concluded that PRISM has been a very productive program. So, the first thought I'd like to leave you with is, what does PRISM's intelligence success mean? There are, very roughly, two perspectives on this. One view is that the program should continue. It's working. That's clearly the perspective the executive branch maintains. Another view is that it's difficult to say what PRISM's success means. That requires playing out some very tricky counterfactuals. For instance, what intelligence would PRISM have developed if NSA analysts had needed to obtain something like a warrant? Or perhaps something lesser, like a de-order? Really, only the NSA internal records could answer those questions. And unsurprisingly, the agency hasn't been very forthcoming. The second thought I'd like to leave you with is, how should we evaluate harm to the technology sector? Like other Section 702 programs, PRISM affords very little protection to foreign individuals, businesses, and governments. And also, like other Section 702 surveillance, PRISM allows for a lot of incidental collection against ordinary Americans. Those certainly remain very real concerns. But there's also something unique about PRISM. It involves a close relationship between technology services and foreign intelligence. Information stored with American cloud providers becomes readily accessible to American intelligence agencies. A number of technology services claim to have lost out on business because of PRISM. So, the question is, how does that harm weigh? Is it relevant? If it is, does it tip the scales against PRISM? That's a very difficult policy question. So, those two thoughts bring to a close the material on PRISM. In the next lecture, I'm going to do my best to explain the other major type of Section 702 surveillance, so-called upstream collection.